Welcome to the, the first ASAP lunchtime talk of 2022. Thank you for being here. Um, it is our pleasure to have Dr. Anish Roshi join us again for, for this series. Um, as you may remember from last time we, we had Anish um, and we introduced him. He has had a prolific and distinguished career in radio astronomy at institutions all around the world. Um, his research focuses on the interstellar medium and molecular cloud formation. And he's been at Arecibo since 2018, where he is a senior observatory scientist and the head of radio astronomy there. And today we are lucky to hear him talk about fresh beginnings at the Arecibo Observatory. And with that, I will turn it over to Anish. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you for inviting me for giving this talk. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to give a flavor of um, the set of projects the astronomy group is uh, involved in. And these projects are done, done with various groups. The best place to start to discuss that is the Francisco's uh, um, chart for our decade, the plan for this decade. So if you look at this chart, um, the HF facility, the status of that is uh, um, <clears throat> Cristiano is right now leading a NSF proposal uh, preparation. And once that proposal is uh, uh, done, it will be submitted to NSF and see what, what we can do with this HF facility restoration. Uh, the second thing which has been listed there is the 12 meter telescope at Arecibo. We are happy to announce that the 12 meter telescope is now operational and is, uh, uh, um, it has started uh, regular observations from January this year. So I will talk about the 12 meter, the current status, uh, what we want to do in the immediate future with that. And a set of observational projects, um, uh, some of them are right now going on, some of them are uh, which we are planning to do when we get the next uh, receiver system. Okay. The third one which is listed here is the drift scan uh, uh, astronomy. The idea there was if the NSF was interested in resurfacing the dish without any platform or without a feed arm, we would like to uh, uh, hang a low frequency feed for drift scan astronomy. But nothing has been, as far as I know, nothing has progressed in that direction. So that is sort of stalled. Uh, the next one that is listed there is advanced data analytics. Uh, this is uh, Francisco has uh, formed a, um, a software group um, to develop and support uh, uh, research activities at Arecibo. And that group is called the advanced data analytics, or it is also called the big data group now. Uh, so we have started a set of projects with the big data group. So I will uh, talk about that, which is the real time FRB detection system with the 12 meter telescope. And also we are supporting an archival data portal, uh, uh, which is being developed by the big data group. The next one, which is listed there is the radio science center. Uh, this center has been funded and it is now called the center for advanced radios uh, advanced research in science and engineering or CARS. It is located at UPR Nanvers and Arecibo is a partner for that um, uh, center. And we have started a set of collaborative projects with the CARS center. Okay. The next three projects are the midterm plan and uh, AO has put three proposals. Uh, and re I regret to say that uh, AO6 is not funded. So two other proposals are in pipeline. We have it to hear from that, from NSF. And the last one is the long-term plan, which is the uh, which we call as the NGAT, the Next Generation Arecibo Telescope. Um, the uh, 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 what is happening right now in NGAT is that uh, we are trying to put a proposal for uh, to NSF to do a preliminary study of the concept which we have put in the white paper. And that proposal is in the infant state. Um, so when it is matured, uh, one of us is happy to give a, a talk to update the community about that. 
So today I will talk about these three activities, which is now moving forward, uh, particularly connected with the uh, radio astronomy group. So the first one is the 12 meter telescope. As uh, uh, many of you know that it's an altissimate mount with the diameter of about uh, uh, 12 meters. It's F over D is uh, the typical value of 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, that change. Uh, and when it was installed, it had a surface RMS of about 0 0.4 millimeter, which means it could go up to 40 gigahertz or so. But I, we, we are right now not sure what is the surface RMS after Maria. We have, to determine that. Um, the elevation limit of this telescope is about 88 degrees, which means it has a large sky coverage. We could go down to detonation of about minus 40 degrees or so. I mean, this has been uh, uh, installed and commissioned. Initial commission was done in 2011-2012. And uh, Phil has also uh, detected the cross correlation of fringes with the 3 305 meter telescope and the 12 meter sometime in 2016. But mostly it was not used for any observations. It was just uh, uh, a part of, uh, 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 it was not used for observations at all. So it, when it was uh, commissioned, it had two room temperature receivers. One is at X and another is at X band. With the S band is about two gigahertz and X band is about 8.5 gigahertz or so. So the, uh, the front end had a, very broadband field and that from that field the two uh, uh, bands are coupled okay and these uh, front end amplifiers are room temperature amplifiers okay right now we have commissioned the x band system all the way up to the back end the s band could not be commissioned because the uh, bandwidth close to the front end was large enough such that some of the strong RFI starts saturating the if system so we have ordered a, a filter, which is which will be arriving sometime now. And once that filter is installed, we will be connecting the S-band system to the to the 12 meter IL and commission the S-band system completely. Uh, the way the signal is connected is the X-band system, uh, the front end signals are connected to the 12 meter IF, and which eventually gets connected to the 305 meter IF system. And therefore, all the backends which have been available for the 305 meter is available for the 12 meter. Okay. So, right uh, immediately, what we have, uh, I mean, in the uh, what we have done so far is to commission the mock spectrometer and the VLBI backend. And all the seven mocks, we are, we are using it uh, um, uh, to get a bandwidth of about one gigahertz. And that's sort of the bandwidth limit of the IF system at 305 meter. And the system temperature is not great because of the room temperature um, receivers. It's about 125 Kelvin at X band and about 100 Kelvin at S band, expected to be about 100 Kelvin at X band. And the telescope is small, therefore the gain is also small. Now we have done a commissioning by end of uh, um, end of 2021. A set of observations has been done. Successful observations has been done. I will go through uh, some of these in the later slides. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, that we have started the science observation by January 2022. And the main science observation which is going on is the solar continuum observation. And we have a, doing a set of uh, other uh, experiments with the 20 meter. Uh, some of them are useful for uh, projects, um, I mean, educational projects for the single day summer school, which will be happening at Arecibo in May. So at this point, I would like to acknowledge the um, engineering team, uh, their efforts. Um, Phil, Felix, Lewis, and the technical staff is the one who got the system working. At. And I think the team deserves a standing ovation for getting the system operational in a year or so. Okay, so with uh, so the what our immediate plan is to uh, replace the front end system with a wideband cryogenic front end. 
when I say wideband, it, it will be a, a single feed which will cover a frequency range from 2.3 to 14 gigahertz. And the system temperature of the new system will be about 35 Kelvin or so. And this project is uh, uh, now funded through the Hurricane Relief Fund. Um, so this is fully, um, I mean, uh, we have already signed, uh, UCF has already signed an agreement with the Cryoelect, which will be uh, uh, building the system. And uh, right now we are waiting for the purchase order to go from UCF to start the work. And the expected time scale to build the entire front end is about eight to nine months. And that is the promised delivery, delivery time scale from the time the purchase order goes to the, to the vendor. <clears throat> And this is the conceptual diagram that was given by Cryoelect. Um, uh, this shows the broadband feed and the uh, 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 cryostat plus the cooler. Um, <clears throat> this is the block diagram of the wideband system. The front end, the uh, full bandwidth 2.3 to 14 gigahertz will be split into two, um, uh, one covering frequencies from 2.3 to 5 gigahertz, and the other one covering from 4 to 14 gigahertz. And these are the signals which will be available to the backends. So uh, while we are waiting for the, this system, we already started, as I mentioned, a set of science observations. And so what I am going to do in the next uh, uh, few slides is to talk about what science the different uh, group members are doing with the 12 meter. Um, uh, some of them are already going on, some of them are planned with the cryogenic, friend, uh, cryogenic product. Okay, so one of the studies which is going on is the heliospheric studies. PK Manoharan and Phil are interested in doing these observations. The basic aim is to um, directly observe sun, uh, uh, particularly the active regions with high spectral and temporal resolution. The idea is to study the non-thermal process associated with CME uh, uh, emission, I mean CME ejections, okay. Um, now these are some, some of the scans that has been taken on with the X-band system on sun. Um, these are uncalibrated, so the, that's the reason the two polarizations are showing different uh, uh, different power. And uh, Manoharan and Phil is also interested to look for microbursts from sun, particularly the active regions of sun. And this is one of the microbursts that has been detected during commissioning uh, last year. Once the wideband system is in place, uh, what Manoharan would like to do is to continue similar observations on sun and also study solar wind using interplanetary scintillation observations. These are uh, uh, observations of interplanetary scintillation of extragalactic sources when its radio wave passes through the solar wind. So that that uh, that scintillation and scintillation uh, observations can be used to uh, uh, constrain the properties of the solar wind, and that will also help in forecasting space weather. So those those are the activities uh, P K Manohan is interested in doing with the cryogenic front end with the twelve meter system, and. Uh, as you can imagine, the cryo system is an overkill for the direct solar observations. So what we are, uh, what we have planned is to have an attenuator slab, a mechanically positioned attenuator slab in front of the cryo system. And whenever the direct sun observations are done, this mechanical attenuator will be uh, kept in front of the sun. And that will be also part of the contract for uh, making this system. Uh, the second project I would like to mention is uh, the PULSA studies. Uh, ben Pereira is uh, leading this effort. Um, uh, at X-Band, we have detected the strongest pulsar, the Vela pulsar, with the bandwidth of about 1 gigahertz. The center frequency of this observation is about 8.6 gigahertz. Um, uh, but many of the other pulsars are too weak to be detected with the room temperature X-Band system. But so what Ben found is that with the S-band system, room temperature S-band system, he could observe at least uh, 10 pulsars with the signal to noise ratio greater than 10 for an indignation time of 10 minutes or so. Uh, so he's planning to start a regular monitoring uh, pulsar uh, monitoring study 
um, once the S Bank system is commissioned. And in addition, when the front end is replaced with the cryogenic uh, uh, wide band system, he would like to do long term high cadence monitoring of young pulsars and bright millisecond pulsars. These bright millisecond pulsars are uh, uh, the pulsars used by the nanograph project, and therefore, these high cadence, high long term observations will certainly support the nanograph project. And uh, and also the wide band, uh, he would like to do wide band full polarization pulsar observation to study the pulsar emission mechanisms. And there are something like 90 pulsars that can be observed for, uh, for these studies. The diagram here shows the sky distribution of the 90 pulsars, which are, which are shown in these blue curves, I mean blue circles. Uh, the circle diameter, I think, uh, uh, represents the signal to noise ratio uh, for 10 minutes of observations. The other project which uh, we would like to do with the 12 meter is the spectral line projects. Alison Smith, one of our postdoc, is leading this effort. Um, there are no molecular lines in the current X band bands, and therefore we uh, looked for uh, recombination lines. And uh, uh, these are the first. Uh, this this is the first detection of recombination line with the 12 meter. It's an uh, observation towards Orion A. And Allison and Phil has done a set of observations towards uh, uh, 10 H2 regions or so recently. And these are some of the uh, preliminary spectra which Phil has put in his website. Um, uh, and they, they are also a recombination line observation towards M17 and W43. Um, the, what we plan to do with the cryogenic front end is uh, uh, to do a survey of molecular lines in the galactic plane. There are several molecules that can be observed between 2.3 and 14 gigahertz. And uh, the, uh, thing, uh, the molecules of most interest are CH, H2CO, and of course, uh, we will also get recombination lines and there are several other molecules that can be observed. Uh, the uh, one of the interesting thing about the CH observation is that there is no complete survey of CH existing. A, 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 a complete survey exists, so uh, the 12 meter survey will be the it will be the first complete survey of galactic uh, uh, complete CH survey of the galactic plane. And uh, uh, CH is uh, coming from extended region, and therefore uh, uh, 12 meter is sufficient to get uh, get the. Um, uh, uh, get this survey done. And the main science goal is that this CH emission is coming from what, what we think as the um, uh, CO dark clouds. Some of those CO dark clouds are in the process of forming uh, a transitioning from atomic to molecule, molecular cloud, which is a molecular cloud in formation. So understanding that, uh, understanding uh, uh, this molecular cloud formation is the primary goal of that survey. Uh, the next project which I want to mention is the continuum observations with uh, uh, with the 12 meter. Sravani Bhadi is uh, 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 our second postdoc is uh, uh, leading this effort. As he, most of you know, one of the major problem with the continuum observations with single dish is uh, the one over f noise. So Sravani and Phil are trying to see how to beat this one over F noise. Basic idea is to inject a train of, uh, I mean, uh, a pulse of uh, cal, no, uh, cal, cal signals and try to estimate the gain and correct it. And I just uh, read yesterday uh, from Phil's uh, email that he could uh, reach up to two to three times the expected noise level doing the gain correction using this switching, which is quite good. And if that, that can be done even for the uh, uh, lower uh, even for lower RMS, then one can uh, start a variety of uh, continuum observations. And what Sravani is interested to start to do with the wide band system is to monitor flux density of quasars. And she has identified something like 200 quasars you can, all over the Sky, it can be observed with the 12 meter and do monitoring observation. And if if the if there's a possibility of simultaneously monitoring the flux density at two different frequencies, it will be a unique capability. I, I don't think any other, as far as I know, any other monitoring system has such a capability. But uh, right now there is IF system limitation to do that. 
we'll see whether we can uh, get over that. And what uh, the science interest is uh, essentially to study the origin of this uh, flux density variability that has been seen in uh, uh, extragalactic source. Oh, uh, uh, this is an example of an observation towards J1415 plus 1320 over, over several uh, tens of years. And these are the new data which uh, uh, Sravani has uh, uh, added to this, mon mon this monitoring program towards this source, and this is what she has published in a recent radio science letters. And uh, this, uh, the origin of this uh, variability has been an old game. People have been uh, uh, doing this for years. But what is, uh, uh, what is interesting that happened recently is the discovery of what is called the systematic achromatic variability. Um, the, uh, if you look at the typical variabilities, uh, you will see that the variability appears at higher frequencies first, and at, at after, a, after a delay, it appears at lower frequencies, which, will, which can be uh, understood in terms of the optical depth variation in, in a synchrotron uh, optical elliptic plasma, expanding to synchrotron optical elliptic plasma. But what this group has discovered is that um, there are variabilities which are symmetric about the minima and, uh, and has the similar variability seen over decades of frequencies. For example, in this plot, you can see uh, a variation, this U-shaped variation, which is at uh, uh, which is at 15 gigahertz, and uh, uh, the green one is at 37 gigahertz, and they show they show similar variability uh, over the over that frequency range, and this can be this similar similarity in the variation has been seen even 10, 10 uh, one order of magnitude uh, uh, higher in frequency, and this uh, uh, what the group has interpreted is that this is possibly due to gravitational lensing of uh, 10 to the power of three solar mass objects in the core of this uh, uh, galaxy. Um, and uh, the 12 meter observations will certainly start discovering more of these in other sources, hopefully. Uh, the next application for the 12 meter, uh, which I want to mention is the VLBA observations. Uh, we have done a successful commissioning observation for the European VLBA network in November. This plot shows the amplitude and the phase of the fringe that has been detected with 12 meter and the Effelsberg telescope. Uh, unfortunately, only one uh, polarization was detected. The other polarization we identified, it was not configured well in our backend. So this is a fringe obtained in one of the polarization between Effelsberg uh, and the 12 meter telescope. And Effelsberg and the European uh, VLBI network is inter interested in integrating the 12 meter with the uh, with their network, uh, not because they want they will get more sensitivity, but they will get better UV coverage, which is what is shown by the simulation done by Sravani. Uh, these are the, the blue curves are the additional baselines uh, uh, obtained with the 12 meter and the European network, and uh, these are plotted for the different uh, sources at different declination, and you can clearly see that the 12 meter adds uh, uh, additional. Uh, I mean. Uh, 12 meter makes the UV coverage better. We are also planning to uh, assign two MOUs. Uh, one is with the Jive group led by uh, Professor Gurwitz. He is basically interested to support this JUICE mission. Uh, the idea is to do VLBA, uh, uh, VLBA technique to locate, to precisely locate the uh, spacecraft. Which is, uh, which is being launched to Ju Ju uh, Jupiter. And uh, the same observations will also give phase and amplitude variation because of the, uh, because of the solar wind uh, between the spacecraft and Earth. So uh, PK Manoharan is interested in uh, using the same data for the solar wind studies. So we are in the process of finding an M MOU and there's a second MOU which, will be, which we are planning to sign with the Skynet program. Um, this is for educational application of 12 meter. Um, and there is also a proposal which we have submitted to the National Science Foundation under the party program. This is to form a partnership with the um, uh, partnership between AO, UPR, Inter-American and the University of Central Florida. 
Okay, the idea of this partnership is to use the 12 meter for uh, undergraduate research programs. Okay, the final uh, project which I want to mention is the uh, use of 12 meter for FRB studies. Uh, again, Ben is interested in uh, interested in this study. He has found that uh, uh, something like twenty percent of the chime detected FRBs we could have detected with the twelve meter at two point five gigahertz with the signal to noise ratio greater than ten. So, which means this is the twelve meter observations, uh, particularly at lower frequencies, will be very useful for detecting FRBs. And of course, uh, wideband observations will give you the spectral structure of the FRBs. But uh, uh, what is more efficient is to have either commensal observations or whenever the telescope is parked, uh, you do real-time detection of FRBs, otherwise the data rate will be extremely large. With that aim, we started a project with the Big Data Group and Ben Pereira is leading that project and Francisco Torres is the person who is uh, uh, leading from the Big Data Group and Arun is supporting that, supporting this effort. Uh, the basic idea is to take the mock data, pass it through a new GPU cluster which UCF has, uh, which we have um, uh, acquired at Arecibo, which is a 10 uh, RTX 3090 GPU cluster. The 10 GPU cluster, G GPUs are there in this cluster. So the data from the mock spectrometer will be uh, pumped to the uh, to this cluster in real time. And uh, uh, the, the best possible candidates will be detected in real time and the data corresponding to only the best candidate will be written into the disk. That is basically the idea of this project. Uh, the second activity which we, we are doing with the Big Data Group is uh, to support the Arecibo archival data portal. I mean, this is a portal which will be interfacing the um, users with the archival data. And Emmanuel is the one who is leading this effort, is the lead software engineer. And Alison is doing a great job in helping with the, uh, testing this software and providing the uh, feedback to the developer. Okay, the last project which I want to mention is the AO collaboration with uh, uh, CARS. CARS is, uh, stands for, as I said, Center for Advanced Research in Science and Engineering. This is a center which is located at UPR Mayagwas, and uh, uh, it is funded by NSF through the Spectrum Initiat Innovation Initiative Program. And we have funding up to something like five years. Uh, uh, the total amount involved is about 15 million or so. And it is a collaboration between the uh, Arecibo and UPR. The ma main goal of this collaboration is to uh, develop systems for RFI monitoring and characterization, as well as to develop RFI mitigation technique for radio astronomy, ra radio astronomy applications. Uh, these are the people involved from UPR Mayanvers, and these are the people involved from Arecibo. Um, Resonance Sciences is one of the private partners of this collaboration. The first, uh, first project which we have taken up, the hardware project which we have taken up is to develop an RFI monitoring system at Arecibo. The idea is to uh, uh, have a monitoring system which will cover frequency range from 10 uh, megahertz to 15 gigahertz and also have the capability, also have the dynamic range and capability to record data at uh, a very fast rate in case we want to characterize the RFI. Okay, so this will have multiple antennas covering this frequency range, and we will be having an analog system, the output of which will be passed through a Xilinx uh, um, FPGA system called the RF SOC, system on chip, uh, and there will be a GPU cluster associated with this. And the Xilinx system which we are going to use is the latest generation Xilinx system, so generation three which can process a maximum bandwidth of about 2.5 gigahertz or so. And that's, uh, that's what we are aiming for. Um, and uh, once this system is developed, uh, we will use the same hardware to, uh, to um, implement, what is, uh, implement an experimental setup for RFI mitigation technique development. And this is what is called the case facility, which involves the 12 meter setup for reference antennas 
and also possibly a small array of as part of this case system. I will come back to this array later. Uh, but the basic goal is uh, uh, to develop, not only to develop RFI mitigation system, uh, mitigation techniques, but we also want to apply it for real observations and show that those data are, 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 um, are, astron are useful for astronomical application after, after applying this technique. And that is the idea of the space facility. So it should be, it should have the, it should have the um, capability to do a mitigation uh, studies. I mean, development of the mitigation and testing of the mitigation study, st technique studies, as well as it should also have the capability of applying that and do real time, uh, do um, astronomical observations with that system. Okay. So it will have a science application as well as engineering applications. And there is also an educational component associated with the cards. They will also be used in this case facility. Uh, there are two research projects which we have undertaken in the first, uh, first year, which is to start uh, um, um, develop RFI excision algorithms, uh, uh, as well as uh, implement that for real time system for 12 meters uh, real, in real time for the 12 meter observation. The second one is to develop RFI mitigation uh, uh, techniques. Again, uh, the idea is where we can, uh, whether we can implement that for the 12 meter observations. So that, that's the goal of these two research projects. And uh, we are, uh, I, I just want to give, uh, I just want to advertise this. We have uh, um, funding for hiring a one signal processing engineer and two postdocs. And we are uh, looking for postdocs who are interested in astronomy and instrumentation. So if uh, anybody knows uh, any such person, please uh, um, let me know. And I mentioned that the case facility also will have a uh, array associated with that. The science, I mean, uh, the basic aim of the case, uh, case facility is whatever you are developing, whatever RFI mitigation technique we are developing should be applicable for the science, uh, science, uh, science purpose also. So the array should have some science application. The application which we have identified is to uh, measure, use this array for power spectrum measurement of extragalactic background radiation at frequencies below three gigahertz or so. At, at these frequencies, it has been recently discovered that there is a class of uh, a new class of um, uh, extragalactic sources which are contributing to the background with unknown properties and the properties of those are those are still not known. So studying those, uh, studying that background will tell you, uh, can put constraints on what is the type of source which is contributing to this extragalactic background. So that's uh, one of the science projects which can be done with this array. You don't require a very large telescope for doing that. Uh, other possibility is we can use the same array for FRB detection in conjunction and localization in conjunction with uh, um, uh, other uh, similar facilities like COD, for example, COD prototypes, for example. And uh, certainly the technical application is what one of it is uh, RFI mitigation techniques for uh, developing at RFI mitigation techniques for interferometers. Whether people like it or not, this will be formed the first prototype for NGAT. The reason is that these experiments, these science experiments, do not require the tele do not require these array, array elements to track a source. It can be array elements sitting on the ground. So it is like the NGAT is a, a, a tilted plate kept on the ground. And you also would have noticed that we are aiming for 2.5 gigahertz bandwidth. Um, this is the bandwidth we have specified in the NGAT white paper, okay, for the, uh, for the bandwidth of the next generation system. So to summarize, um, I mean, we have initiated several new exciting projects after the collapse of the 305 meter telescope. Um, AO astronomy groups welcome collaborations in any of these projects. And you are, I mean, everybody is aware that these are all small steps in preparation for a big leap. With that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Let's everybody give Anish uh, virtual applause, or you can unmute and applaud and clap for real. <laughs> Seriously, you. Anish, thank you for this talk. Um, so if, if you want to type your questions in the chat, I'm happy to ask them for you, but also if you would like to unmute and ask Anish directly, please do. 
Um, we do have one question that Marshall wrote in the chat that you may have answered, but he was asking about plans for VGOS observations. So I think no. you might. No, we do not have any plan for a uh, VGOS observation right now. The reason being that it requires uh, uh, requires uh, uh, phase calibration techniques, which we don't have funds to implement right now. And also, we need to upgrade our VLBI backend. To it. Again, fund is not available for that. OK. Um, I was wondering if you would say a little more about the archival data plans, that, that project and the plans. Like, where, where will the data live? What is the sort of infrastructure for making it available to everybody? Do you have a sense of where that's headed? Because that seems like that could Yes, uh, um, I, I may not be the right person to give the up-to-date thing, but uh, uh, since I have been uh, uh, um, uh, sitting in the meetings where the, uh, the testing related discussions were going on, I can share uh, what I know. Uh, now, as far as I know, the, a large fraction of the data has been uploaded to the Texas server, TACC server. Okay. Um, the uh, what is lacking right now is this data portal so that users can actually ac uh, access that data. Uh, so once the user, uh, the once the portal is uh, debugged, I mean uh, the testing of the portal is over, uh, we will make this available for the users and users can start um, start using the data. That that's the plan. Is there already the software developed to an, like look at, analyze the data, or is that something that still has to be done? No, the uh, the assumption with which we are working on right now on testing this data portal is that uh, the users will be using uh, the ideal routines available at Arecibo to process the data. Okay, gotcha. Um, Robert asks in the chat, where is the 12 meter located? I, uh, this is uh, Robert Minchin. He should know. Uh, no, no, no. Robert no. Frampton. <laughs> Lots of Roberts out there. This is Robert Frampton is asking this. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think I didn't mention that. Uh, I assumed everybody knows that it is a. Uh, uh, it is located within the Arecibo Observatory, um, close to the entrance uh, uh, of the observatory, the main entrance to the observatory. I cannot say anything better than that right now. Uh, I don't have a Google map. Accessible. <laughs> that works. Other questions? Um, Pia asks, uh, is there any interest in adding additional 12 meter dishes, perhaps on the hills where the towers once stood? Of course, there's no funding right now. I just wonder if ideas like that are being discussed as long-term projects, as I remember a few people discussing such ideas shortly after the collapse. OK. Uh, well, one of the projects which was closely linked with that question is the AO6, which uh, has not been funded. Um, now, if if we are moving forward with the NGAT like a concept, uh, then the antennas should be close by. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, in that, in if that is the project we are moving forward, then uh, uh, keeping the antennas at different uh, uh, mountains will not be. Uh, will, will not uh, will not be consistent with the development of that project. So we have to see how that can be incorporated. That makes sense. Other questions? Um, Sean, oh, Sean gives a map in the chat, everybody, of where the 12 meter is on Google Maps, if you want to have a, a more precise look at that. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah. Do you know when, um, when, for example, the PARE grant and some of the other funding decisions will be made? Is there a timeline that uh, you have a sense of? Yeah, I was told that uh, it, will, it should be available by July latest, because okay. we asked this question to NSF whether we can advertise, we need to advertise it before the next semester starts, which is in August. So sometime in July, we should know that, uh, that's what they said. And is the, the PARE idea similar to um, the, the center that you're already collaborating with? What is, what is the uh, PARE No, the, okay. the major difference is that the center we are, we are collaborating is for tech, mostly for technology development. Okay. But the uh, PARE program is uh, uh, focused on science. So, okay. the, uh, so we thought that is a missing link and therefore we focused on the science part for in project. 
Gotcha. So um, Abel asks, are there any plans to connect CIMA to the, or CIMA to the 12 meter? That's a question to Phil, that Phil may be in, the, in, the, in this meeting. Mm -hmm. So I wanna answer that? Is Phil here? Yeah, Phil's here. Phil, are you willing to answer that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, uh, well, you'll have to stay tuned. Um, I was wondering if with the, the things like the CME observations and the FRBs, do you have um, coordination efforts with other telescopes, um, you know, with these time sensitive observations? Do you, do you, are you part of a network? Is the 12 meter part of an, a larger worldwide network for follow up of these kinds of events? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, we, um, well, we try to have a collaboration with uh, uh, um, uh, with the group in Canada who were interested in localizing the FRBs and they uh, they were trying to get time in different uh, uh, small telescopes. Um, unfortunately, their frequency range was 400 to 800 megahertz mm. uh, because they were uh, they wanted it to be um, mm -hmm. Uh, aligned with uh, the chime frequency range. Mm -hmm. So we did an RFI survey at Arecibo and found that there's hardly any frequency available in that range unless we develop this RFI mitigation techniques and suppress them. <laughs> so therefore they lost a sort of interest and we, uh, we also didn't pursue that. Partly we didn't pursue it because that requires a, a separate off focus a receiver tuned to 400 to 800 megahertz, a prime focus receiver for the 12 meter. Right now it is a Cassegrain focus and only one feed can be put there. So we thought uh, we'll take, if there is sufficient interest among the group members, we take it up at later stage. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, Marshall asks, it's not clear to me how much VLBI the 12 meter can or will do. Um, Juice observations would be VLBI with pride. Are there any plans to do other VLBI with which array? Uh, uh, the VLBI observations will be done with the EVN network, the 12 meter telescope. Uh, EVN is very interested to, uh, once we have the uh, cryogenic receiver, they are interested to incorporate uh, a 12 meter as one of the telescopes that will be available for EVN observations. So uh, the most of the observations will be with the EVN. In, um, but the frequency range is 2.5 to 14. The, uh, only in that frequency range, when it over uh, the science overlaps, we can participate in those observations. Anish, is the VLBA also interested? Um, we, we talked to the VLBA group uh, at NRO, I mean, basically NRO. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, they had difficulty in uh, promising that 12 meter will be part of a uh, VLBA network. Thank you. Uh, part, partly it is funding, partly it is uh, the dish is a different size dish. Right. All right. Other questions? This one might be one for, for Allison that I was wondering when the CH map might be completed. That sounds interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, one, uh, one pixel requires about an hour of observations. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's a big effort. That's, that's great, though. So that's, that, great. that's the reason I, uh, it would be great if we could put these spectrometers in other molecular lines so some of those can be detected. Yeah. You mentioned that um, the 12 meter can or would have detected at roughly 20% of the CHIME FRBs, correct? Is that right? Um, I don't rem off know off the top of my head the sort of the rate per year, like how many per year does that translate to? Um, uh, um, no, I think uh, Ben can answer that question. We had recently put a limit on that from our uh, uh, scan observations. Uh, but I think Ben will know that number straight away. Oh, well, it's not top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Fine, I, I was just curious. I thought Chime is on the order of hundreds 
per year. I've seen so I've seen widely varying predictions for chime, um, and so I'm just trying to think if this yeah. is. Me. I think they have detected so far about like 600 uh, FRBs, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they they regularly detect FRBs because they have the real time and uh, full sky. Mm -hmm. So right. I've, yeah, the the rate is not top of my head. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Other questions? Anish, how do you see these projects in the big scheme with the NECGEO and, and, and other projects? How do you put all these small projects in context with the big scheme that you have for Arecibo? Uh, well, uh, see the develop. Uh, see the basic idea of many of these technology development and uh, uh, things which are close. Uh, uh, the uh, projects which are connected with uh, uh, observations like the real time FRB. The basic idea is to uh, build up the technical capability of. Uh, um, uh, Arecibo to take up something much bigger than that. So that's what I mentioned at the end of the summary that we are doing this small step essentially to get the get to the point where we can take up a much bigger um, project. So that's the way I look at it. But I, uh... Thank you. I have a, a, a technical question about J, what is it, 1415 plus 1320? Are you willing to? Yeah, and Slavani should be here, I believe, yeah. Okay, I, I just, um, so that I was really interested. This is a blazar, right? Is this not? A... Yes, it is a blazar. Okay, and you were saying that this um, symmetric variability would be indication of lensing by 10 to the three, 10 to the four solar mass objects. Are we talking yes. like intermediate mass black holes? Yeah, something like that. that. Idea? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so that is already very cool. But the um, you showed a lag between two different bands. And not not for the acid. Acid. Um, I I will show you the picture. Am I sharing the screen? Not yet, right? Not yet. Uh, typically, when you have a flare, you will see a delay from uh, between the, I mean, as you go lower in frequency, it appears later. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that is the case for this flare F1 and F2. But for SAV, uh, you don't see that delay all the way uh, to uh, from from something like uh, 15 gigahertz all the way to even I think they have detected all the way up to 100 gigahertz or so or even higher. Okay, so they are uh, uh, they uh, exactly align like a U shape, and the dip amplitude of the dip is uh, uh, similar. Okay, mm -hmm. and therefore they interpreted this as uh, uh, the best possibility is uh, because it is achromatic, it should be gravitational. Mm -hmm. Now we haven't seen that at 327 megahertz, uh, 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 and that is, uh, that is what this paper di discusses, mm -hmm. one of the results this paper discusses. Mm -hmm. And the primary reason is that uh, if this uh, radiation is because of the core emission, the core becomes optically thick at 327 megahertz. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, uh, if the core is what is gravitational lens, you don't see it at lower frequency. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is consistent with, uh, we didn't have enough sensitivity to rule out their model, but it is consistent with their model, the non-detection at 327 megahertz. Okay, I'll have to look at for that paper. That's That's very cool. Thank you. Any other last questions before we wrap up? 
Um, ben writes in the chat to answer Nicole's question regarding FRB rate. It turns out to be less than 10 to the 5 per sky per day at L band. Thank you. Thank you. Anish, since everybody here is, um, you know, we, we support Adecibo and we're excited about the future of Adecibo. Um, do you have any advice for us about what we can do as a community to support and to help and to grow um, all of these great projects? Um, <laughs> if, you, if you ask me immediately, we want two postdocs. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> right, advertise those jobs, everybody like this. Yeah, yeah, we haven't advertised to the edge because uh, uh, um, the subaward is not at, uh, in place at UCF. Only after that, I can advertise that. Advertise that. Mm -hmm. I have been talking to informally to various people to see anybody is interested. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, it is a, a, a great thing to support all of our efforts from, by the community. And even I could see something like uh, 50, 60 people have joined even today, right, for this talk. So they are all interested in it. That shows a great support from the community, which itself is a great. Um, uh, other than that, at this point, uh, I cannot say uh, what else you can help with. Um, see, if you are still haven't identified how to move forward with the next big thing. So once that comes, then we need a lot of support from the community to uh, publicize it, communicate with the community that concept and get further, increase the support base and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's my opinion, although it is, uh, 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 we have put this NGAT as the concept in the telescope. We have to still work on various things to say, okay, that is what we are going forward with. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any last final thoughts, questions, comments before we finish up? All right, well then, thank you so much again, Anish, for, for being willing to, to come here and talk to us about all these very cool things. Um, and uh, everybody else, you know, everybody stay tuned for the next talk in this series. Um, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.